Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Facility Superintendent Training Webinar Series. Hi, I'm Wendy Faulkner, Assistant Executive Director of CJCA. This is our first session in a four-part series of webinars. In today's webinar, we will explore understanding and responding to trauma in context, the role of development and culture. I would like to thank all of you for taking time to participate. And special thanks to Dr. Monique Morrow, our presenter for today, who's put a great deal of work into the preparation of this webinar. At this point, I'm going to ask Darlene Conroy to provide us with a few technical instructions before we start. Darlene? Thank you, every thank you, Wendy. At the end of the presentation, there will be a Q&A session. Please type your questions in at any time during the webinar, and these will be answered in the 10 to 15 minutes um, at the end of the webinar. Today's webinar is being recorded. A copy of the PowerPoint and link to the recording will be sent to attendees following the webinar. Dr. Marrow? Hello. Uh, thanks so much for this opportunity as well and um, um, for the chance to talk a little bit about this most important topic. Um, I'm Dr. Monique Marrow. I'm a child psychologist by trade. Uh, I've worked in the juvenile justice system from the moment I got my license. So um, that was approximately 10 to 12 years uh, with the Ohio Department of Youth Services. Uh, before moving on to do some additional consulting work. Um, currently the owner of Youth Trauma and Justice Solutions, and uh, I work pretty much nationally uh, on projects related to trauma, juvenile justice, and system reform um, for agencies that serve children. So uh, it can be even child welfare or education. Uh, but this gives me a nice, uh, overview of the ways in which systems view trauma as as well as development so we're going to focus on those two topics today uh, we included the term or i included the term culture and i really want you to think about culture as not just of course race but all of the defining pieces around a child that creates who that child is so that's um, essentially how i'm thinking about culture okay uh, it's not letting me advance the slides. Uh, it's not letting me advance the slide. Monique, I just shared the keyboard and mouse. If you could try again. Okay. Thank you. So uh, I'm also a member of the National Child Traumatic Stress Network, um, which really has a mission to um, raise the standard of care and improve access to services for children, youth, and, and families who have experienced trauma. Uh, there are a number of resources available on our NCTSN website if there would be anything that you might be interested in related to trauma and juvenile justice. There's, we even have a specific section just for that. I do a small self-care alert just to remind you that we're going to be talking about um, young people, but in the course of this, we're going to be talking about uh, traumatic events, difficult events, adversity, and so we just want to make sure that you um, are taking time and, and just monitoring self. So when we think about trauma, trauma probably has many names and people talk about trauma today uh, pretty much all the time. About every day I hear something about trauma. That wasn't necessarily true back in 2005 when I started doing this work um, in juvenile justice settings. But when we look at it, there's post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, but I often think, well, really, is it really over? Which was my initial concern when I started doing this work with kids in the justice system, because it seems like it was ongoing for them. Uh, adverse childhood experiences was kind of the next piece uh, when you think about that, and we'll talk more about that. Um, inequity, which is something that I'll define later, but really is to me an extremely important part when we look at the impact of trauma on a young person. Uh, we'll talk about it in terms of the wounding of the spirit, which takes more of a um, racial cultural view of trauma. And then finally, we'll talk about complex trauma, 
or what I call SLS, and you'll excuse me, but essentially I, I, I refer to that when I talk to the kids as shitty life syndrome, which really means that many areas of the child's life are impacted by things that are outside of their control often um, and seem unfair. So we're gonna begin with the definition of PTSD. Post-traumatic stress disorder, when we look at DSM-5 is defined in this way. It's the experience of exposure to actual or threatened death, serious injury or sexual violation, and the individual experiences it directly, is a witness to it. And while we have a child here, it really doesn't matter if the child is the witness adult, adolescent, but that you witnessing something that's happening to someone else that you believe um, will result in um, death or serious injury or sexual violation. The next is potentially that you hear about uh, the graphic details of a traumatic event from someone else. And, and the key piece about this is that if you are learning about this and the person is sharing content, which can in some way create imagery for you and your mind as you think about it. So that becomes really important for me because not only do individuals share graphic content by telling these days, but uh, I, I recall when the um, shootings in Florida were happening in the school building, my daughter was actually streaming content it seemed directly from there somehow um, so the level of exposure to things across the world that you aren't necessarily directly connected to can also be a piece. Or finally, as a function of the work that you do every day, it's very possible that you are exposed to traumatic events directly or the aftermath of traumatic events for those that you serve. So the key piece I think about when we look at PTSD that I want, I, I like to emphasize is it's actual or threatened. So it does not mean that something actually has to happen. It just has to be that you believe something could happen. And so that means that traumatic events are really up to the experiencer. So what makes something traumatic for me may not make it traumatic for you. It's really what you believe about that particular event, what, how afraid you are that you could have um, experienced injury. So one of the things to think about is that people, younger people, you think about young children, they have a lot of fears and phobias. So what they see is potentially, uh, dangerous or could cause death or um, injury may be very different than an older person. So that's why we know that traumatic, traumatic events that occur at a young age are often more impactful um, for young children. Uh, in addition, we think about young children, a lot of times I will hear a parent say, well, Johnny was not even in the room at the time that the event occurred. So he didn't see anything. Well, actually being what I call an ear witness at times can be worse than being an eyewitness because an ear witness creates a vision inside of their head of what they're not seeing. And so it can actually be worse in many ways. To give an example, I worked with a program that served um, young women and I do some, um, I was doing a focus group with young women about uh, safety, which is both physical and psychological, which we'll talk more about. But in this uh, program for young women, they were talking about an experience where another young woman was, um, was pinned down uh, as a result of some behavior that she was having. And in the result, uh, as a result of that, one of the things they were, that the staff were attempting to do was to get her to give up items that could be used for self-injury. And so the girls were all placed back in their room. The windows were such that they really couldn't see the floor or, or where the girl was. All they could do was hear what she was saying. And what they heard was, get off of me, stop doing that. Don't take my clothes, please don't take my clothes. Don't touch me like that. That's all they heard. And so in the context of that, you can imagine they're creating quite a few 
visual images of what's happening that can be difficult for them. So keeping those aspects in mind. So when we think about a traumatic event, um, that in order to make something qualify as traumatic, you also have to have symptoms that occur after that. There needs to be a response or a traumatic stress reaction. So briefly, here are the list of potential traumatic stress reactions. Uh, when I used to train this, and this is all I really had to work with, we tried to look at this and say, while well, many of the young people you work with may never meet formal criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder, and they still really won't. Um, they may experience symptoms that are equally as troublesome, particularly in residential environments. So the first uh, symptom we see is intrusion. And intrusion is anything that kind of intrudes into your consciousness and kind of hijacks your thinking for the time. So it, it could be that you're sitting in a classroom and all of a sudden you inside of your head um, you're wondering is he going to get me is he going to hurt me is he going to find me here that's an intrusive um, thought uh, you may also have nightmares nightmares are intrusions and you, you think they're intruding into um, your consciousness when you are asleep so nightmares are another form of intrusion intrusion is a symptom that can be a troubling because kids that experience intrusion will also often engage in the, ne in the next uh, symptom, which is avoidance. So if you have a young person that is having nightmares or difficulty sleeping, night terrors, one of the things that they may do is to attempt not to sleep, which means I'm sure third shift staff are not very happy, but they try and keep themselves awake so that they are not experiencing these intrusive nightmares. And that's really an avoidance strategy. Avoidance is anything that you do to avoid experiencing a trauma reminder or thinking about the trauma or re-experiencing that trauma. So there are internal reminders that one avoids sometimes, and there are external reminders that one avoids. Uh, a simple external reminder is, I got into a major accident, let's say on Broad and High Street, uh, wrecked my car, I was injured, my passenger was injured. So I might therefore avoid Broad and High because I don't really want, I get very nervous or overwhelmed when I'm in that area. Or I may avoid driving altogether. That's a kind of an external um, reminder, something that uh, you see um, that you're trying to avoid. But the avoidance ones that I think of as most important when it comes to young people are really the internal reminders. Internal reminders are things like love, affection, and connection. So essentially, feelings, emotions can be reminders of traumatic events, particularly for individuals who were harmed in the context of a relationship. So whether they were harmed by a parent or they were harmed by a caregiver, maybe harmed by someone that they were in a relationship with, you might find that they're avoiding um, those uh, feelings because they don't want to be hurt again. Uh, when I talk about this in, uh, at trainings, I usually talk about just think about all of the different Tyler Perry movies almost all of them include a female character who's been harmed in some way in the context of a relationship, either as a child, an adult, or both. And she is often perceived as cold and, um, you know, just is, doesn't have time for a relationship, is all into her kids, but really not open to a new relationship. That would be considered kind of an avoidance of internal reminders. The next is alterations, negative alterations in cognitions and mood. Basically what this means is a young person often you will see experiences some uh, depressive like symptoms, some difficulty experiencing positive emotions, um, negativity. So this is the child that will say, I know you have that great program where I can, you know, go to school, get a job, 
um, and still fulfill you know, all of the requirements of probation. Um, and they even provide me a place to live and I have no place to live, but I don't want to do it. You know, that is that kind of, it's never going to work for me kind of viewpoint. The next one's hyperarousal or reactivity. And this is probably the most common symptom that people think about when you think about traumatic stress, you think of that person that's kind of jumpy, living on the balls of their feet, always ready to respond. Um, that's hyperarousal or reactivity. Dissociation is a disconnection between mind and body. Um, and dissociation is something we think about as almost developing because our bodies and minds are trying to protect us from something that has happened. Uh, we most often see dissociation in individuals who've experienced sexual abuse or very young children, pre-verbal children who, for whom traumas have occurred at that level. Uh, an example that I think about with this is if you're if you are being sexually assaulted, okay, there's a lot that's happening in kind of to your body at that time. And the only way that you can really escape that is to escape outside of your body. So it's like you're uh, people will often describe this as I'm observing what happened to me, but I'm not inside of myself. I'm daydreaming. And so you will often see people that have extreme trauma dissociate um, in the middle of all kinds of activities. They might be sitting in class and they just look like they're daydreaming, but really um, they're kind of dissociating. If you watch the movie Precious, when Precious was you know, on the red carpet or um, you know, something that was kind of looked like a, a daydream of some sort, that was her dissociation to avoid the stressor that was in front of her, whether it was school or her mom or whatever. Numbing is the final one there. And, and numbing really relates to emotional numbing. So individuals who do not seem to experience emotion, they don't seem to show emotion. Many people describe kids who are constantly numb as callous and unemotional. Or we even talk about callous and unemotional traits. That one to me is one of the most important ones in this whole group because what we often see when we talk to young people is that their affect does not seem to fit. They don't seem to be remorseful or show emotion or show um, sadness uh, about an event. Um, and that's particularly important when you think about them being, for example, in court. Because when you're sitting in court, uh, the reality of it is if you um, show some level of remorse, some that you're sorry for something, that people are more likely to um, be more lenient than if you sit there and you look as though you are not. So this, but really some of our kids are just plain not. Um, okay. So we think about these tra trauma responses. Um, some of these are really important, uh, particularly in the population of, of young people that we serve. So community violence exposure and those arousal symptoms, like you're always on the balls of your feet, anxious or busy, seem to predict reactive aggression. So we know that kids who've experienced community violence and the primary symptom that they have is arousal is they are more likely to respond in an aggressive manner when provoked. So that's a piece. The second is, if we take into account, you know, or even out the total number of traumas, like, you know, doesn't that, that all of the participants have about the same number of traumas or traumatic events, PTSD symptom severity, so how severe the symptoms were, um, how much they impacted your, your, your functioning on a day-to-day basement, day-to-day -day basis, was associated with the frequency of delinquent behavior. So keeping that, we understand that kids with high PTSD symptoms are more likely to also have more delinquent behaviors. It doesn't mean it's causative, but we see those two things related. And finally, the connection between those callous and unemotional traits um, and numbing 
seem to be particularly related to incidents when a person feels as though they've been betrayed. So we may see this more often in individuals who experience interpersonal traumas because of course, you know, a car accident usually is not gonna make you feel betrayed. But when you feel as though someone has betrayed you, um, you can't trust them. That's when we begin to see these more callous, unemotional um, traits existing. So I think those are important for the young people that we serve. The prevalence rates of PTSD in the population of kids in contact with the justice system is higher than community rates. So we know about between 11 and 50 percent of kids um, that are in the justice system have experienced uh, PTSD versus six to seven percent in community examples. When we look at the past year rate of uh, PTSD in detained youth um, compared to community samples, it's again almost three times or a little over three times as high. And finally, I think when you're looking at uh, the, the third one there, comorbidity is a role, which means that a good portion of the young people who have a trauma history are likely to be diagnosed with other disorders like mood, anxiety, or disruptive behavior disorders. That does not mean those are misdiagnoses. I know back in the day, people used to say, well, the kid is, is misdiagnosed. What we're really saying is that if a child has PTSD, there's a good likelihood that while the trauma may have caused the PTSD, it can also create mood or anxiety or disruptive behavior disorders. So uh, there's a study by um, um, Teplin, which we often cite, that says about 93% of detained youth with PTSD met criteria for at least one other disorder. So that's not saying that 93% of youth met criteria for one comorbid disorder. It means that of those diagnosed with PTSD, which is not easy to get diagnosed with that, um, they usually have an additional disorder. So, but PTSD, um, really doesn't tell the whole story and I, that is what probably was most troubling to me when we when i started was that when i looked at the symptoms and the symptoms have actually been expanded since 2005 when i be, developed training around this topic but it really didn't describe the young people and yet i knew trauma had to be a huge piece of what was happening to them so um now we begin to look at other things. And so these are the, the other pieces that a young person experiences. And we wanna talk about the social determinants of health and well-being. So this, besides experiencing a traumatic event, which the prevalence rates of experiencing a traumatic event potentially are, can be similar um, across a number of socioeconomic groups, but the impact is disproportionately greater on individuals who expect from uh, poorer communities, uh, from individuals that are uh, from less represented populations. So we think about social determinants of health and well being. Conditions in the places where people live, learn, work, and play affect a wide range of health risks and outcomes. So, not just physical health, but also mental health. And this is the idea that zip code has more to do with health and well being and exposure to response to trauma, exposure to and response to trauma than your genetic code. So, where you live, the environments in which uh, you grow up and uh, are returned are extremely important. Um, so, one of the individuals that begins talking a little bit more broadly about the experience of trauma is Dr. Kenneth Hardy. And he's not the only one, but he's one of the major players in this area in terms of talking about what he calls socio-cultural trauma, which includes often the social determinants of health. And I like this idea that it's the wounding of the spirit because that's what I often see when you when you see individuals who've experienced extreme trauma, it's you, you see that they've been wounded in some way. 
that they're changed in some sp specific way that is far deeper than just symptoms. Um, so this is how he describes uh, the wounding of the spirit in terms of how this occurs in um, several populations of people. So the first thing that he talks about is this devaluation of individual or group that you don't have to fear death. You don't have to fear sexual violation or injury to be um, to experience an event that over time kind of erodes um, your capacity um, for wellness or well-being. And so devaluation of individual or group is occurs when an individual in some way is viewed as less than. Uh, and it can occur in, for example, a family. You might have a child whose parent is consistently saying, you know, you're dumb, you'll never amount to much, you won't make it unless you're on your back. That's a devaluation of that individual, of that child. Um, and so it can happen there. That individual can be devalued in a school when they are um, said, you know, those kids, they don't ever succeed. They'll just, you know, they'll probably drop out before the end of high school. Um, they're just born dumb. That's a devaluation. Um, and, and then we also think about devaluation of entire groups of individuals. It could be based on race. So, you know, we think about uh, our, our leadership uh, here in the US. There's been many times when our own president has talked about people as, you know, those people from those shithole places or women or um, other groups, uh, cultural, ethnic groups and really is saying, you know, they don't have value. Why should we let them um, be here? That's a devaluation of an individual or a group, um, or maybe your sexual orientation puts you at a place where our society just doesn't see you as valuable. The second uh, measure is that sometimes it's that uh, a child or a person may experience a disruption or erosion of their community. Community begins at home. So your very first community is your family of origin, who you, who, who you are born to. Um, and that is whether or not, even if you're given up for adoption, particularly at birth, your very first community is that family. And so kids who find out, you know, they are adopted, there is a sense of, you know, why did they give me away? Was I unlovable, unworthy? Um, um, you know, going to be a problem for them. So that could be an initial disruption. We also have kids that, just like I talked about before, their family discredits kind of who they are. That can create a disruption or erosion in that community. Kids that are removed from homes cre can create a disruption. Uh, parents who are removed or incarcerated can decrate, can cause a disruption. And then if we think broader in, in terms of community, we also see the communities, physical communities, where um, kids live. And sometimes as a result of all of the forces that are upon that community, these young people are dealing with uh, severe violence, which, which essentially violence is one of the things that can either unite or destroy a community. In many instances, this can destroy a community. And so a child doesn't have the same relationships with neighbors and people, you know, at the local market and, and just because people don't trust each other. So they're not engaging in a process where they are helping one another. Um, you don't have that sense of that sense of community, of belonging that can exist. So when an, an, a community erodes, um, that has an impact on a child. And so many other resources in that community are impacted. You will see failing schools often, uh, buildings that are falling apart. Um, if we think back to the last picture of the child kind of uh, walking in a, um, you know, next to a building that's got graffiti and is partially broken down, that's where that kid lives. And you think about what does that, what does that cause that child to think about their own personal value? So 
The next one is dehumanization of loss. And this is one when we think about sometimes our society sees some lives as more valuable than others. That, you know, if a bunch of kids in the inner city are hurting each other, killing each other, no big deal. I mean, they're doing it to each other. They must be used to this all the time. They don't, they potentially don't even grieve. I mean, they're just violent people. So the idea that a child's lost in that community is like, well, you know, it's, it's the six o'clock news. It's not really something that people focus on. Whereas if a child is lost in another community that might be more, uh, more of the predominant community or SES community, you begin to see much larger focus of attention on that community. Think about the school shootings that happen. Yes, a lot of lives are lost, but more lives are lost every day in communities. So that maybe I'm not valuable. So this dehumanization. Um, there's a, a movie called, the, called Freedom Riders that I often use for training. And in it, um, one of the characters talks about all of the death, all of the people he's lost um, in his community. And his statement is, to you, he was just another dead body on the street corner. But to me, he was my friend. And it really points out that he understands that nobody really gives a darn about him or his friend. But this is meaningful to me, you know, so that's that dehumanization or loss. And so one of the things that Dr. Hardy often talks about, he says uh, of his own upbringing, hey, you know, um, I was trained as a psychologist. And as a psychologist, I was trained as one of the best white psychologists one could think of. And you can see in the picture, he's obviously not a white psychologist. But what he was saying is, I didn't really learn how to treat people individually and to understand that diagnosis is not just about um, kind of this clinical piece. It really has to involve every aspect of that human being. And therapy and our interventions must be culturally responsive in order to be effective, um, which is somewhat against or, or poses challenges sometimes for some of our gold standard evidence-based practices because they, the, the clinical trials necessary for those are very clean. And so you, you really can't vary very much or consider other things um, in order to make sure that it's an evidence-based or uh, gold standard kind of practice. But I, I appreciated what he said. And then one of the things he said when he was, began working with clients is, um, rage was nothing that was acceptable. Anger was not uh, acceptable. It was viewed as a, uh, a sign of deeper pathology in some way. And in this model, what he says is, to be quite honest, if you experience devaluation as an individual, you live in a community that's disrupted, you're, you don't matter whether you live or you die, that it's very possible the natural outcome of that mm, is this rage. And so one of the, important parts about this that he discusses is before you can really go anywhere else with a young person or anybody who's experienced these things is you have to acknowledge that their rage is valid. You have to acknowledge that what, the, what they've experienced is unfair. Um, and then you can begin to talk about, but how do we avoid allowing this rage to essentially um, eat at you? Uh, how do we treat it so that your life is better? What do we do about that? And so he does a lot of work around social justice issues uh, with young people. So part of what you heard gets at this issue oops, of equity and um, inequality. 
Uh, so when we think about equity, and I'm sorry, equity and inequity, uh, health equity is the notion that all people should have a fair opportunity to attain their full health potential, and that no one should be disadvantaged from achieving this potential if it can be avoided. That's when we talk about health equity, we're, we're saying how do we ensure that everyone has the opportunity to attain their best life, their best uh, state of health, mental health, well-being. Health inequities are differences in health status between population groups that are socially produced, systematic in their unequal distribution across the population, and avoidable and unfair. So health inequities are often those things that whether it's policy, governance, or whatever it is, that there's kind of these, this uh, red tape or even uh, lack of cultural responsivity that makes it more challenging for certain populations to achieve health equity, okay? So this is, uh, uh, I think, a really, I'm not, okay, oops. I have trouble with this. Okay, good graphic for that. So some people say we all need to be equal and equal or equality really means that everyone is given the exact same resources. Everyone is treated in exactly the same way, which may sound really good. However, when you treat everyone the, exactly the same way, that might be giving everybody the same type of intervention or giving everybody the same um, uh, resources. The problem is some people need more or different things to be successful. Uh, and the way I think about this is if, if your children are going to go to college and we say that everybody is going to be accepted into the university, and we might say that's equal. We gave everybody a chance to go to college. The, the issue is that not everybody is equally equipped to succeed in college. And so that's where equity comes in. Equity means that you are actually, yes, you got accepted, but we give these kids a little more resources to assist them to be successful. This other population doesn't need that. You know, we think about, this is what happens when we think about programs designed for first generation young people. Uh, those young people need something a little bit different than uh, kids who the last four generations, all everybody's been to college. Um, they may come in a little more prepared. So that's equity. And then we say, well, you know, to be honest, when it comes to this issue of trauma, well-being, uh, um, and particularly for justice-involved kids, this is reality that they not only don't experience equality, they definitely don't experience equity um, they really start behind and stay behind because most systems say, hey, I've given you what you need. Um, he had a chance to go to school. Uh, one of the things that I note uh, when, we, when we look at, for example, the school, which I don't want to harp on schools because I find that the teachers and facilities get a really bad rap a lot of days, so do mental health providers, uh, but, and some rightly so. But the idea that, you know, you'll hear people say, well, we taught the kids. They're, we're doing the same curriculum we're doing in the community. These kids just don't want to learn. Well, the reality is no. They might need something different. One of the programs that I work with uh, decided they were going to do block scheduling. Block scheduling inside of a facility. So the kids were supposed to be in one classroom for about 90 minutes, you know, covering the exact same topic. They did not move. And, and yet the teachers were wondering, why are they so disruptive? Why are they um, acting out? Why are they you know, sleeping? Because many of these kids, one, haven't been in school consistently as a uh, overall. Two, many of them have other, um, whether you call them disabilities or uh, issues, those kids, you know, have intentional issues, other things. 90 minutes is not a realistic expectation. And they're all not on the same page or able to learn at the same rate. And so to give equity, we really have to account for those things for those young people.
90 minute block probably wasn't the best option um, for that, that system. So we're really talking about those things. Um, so this is a graphic uh, that speaks to the environmental factors that on top of trauma impact the young people. And this is really the graphic around the social determinants of health, because these are the things that create inequity um, in population. So when we look at uh, the, the kind of the tree on the left, you know, kind of focus on, you know, the soup that this child might come from includes uh, an environment where there are environmental toxins, whether there's lead, whether there's, um, you know, there's a dumping site nearby um, where I'm from. There's a trash burning power plant on the south side of town that has caused cancer in a number of individuals, but they didn't have the kind of political power to uh, say anything about this. It's like you move things like that into communities where people don't feel they're empowered to say anything. So that's the root. There's also discrimination, institutional racism, occupational hazards. So some of the things that, that um, Dr. Hardy talks about are there in the root and you just see the root is not as well developed, okay? Um, that leads to the development of a tree that has members that are disconnected. We talked about uh, these under-resourced communities, people are working more, often double, double um, shifts, doing multiple kinds of things kind of to make it. And so, you know, there people aren't lounging out on their front porch, you know, at, after after work at five o'clock, which is might be typical in some way. Um, people become disinvested. Uh, you don't see you don't see um, jobs coming into these communities. Uh, that they, they don't, like I said, have a sense of empowerment. That they don't have uh, agency or ability to impact, or at least they don't. They're they're taught to believe they cannot. So they're, they are often bombarded with fragmented systems that sometimes have contradictory requirements in order for you to be eligible that aren't really working together or would require more time in your day to access than you actually have if you want to work. So those are the, the kind of the environment in which many of these kids are also experiencing their lives. We do know when we look at what happens then is that there are a much greater likelihood of higher levels of violence, smoking, substance abuse, HIV AIDS, infant mortality is higher in these communities, malnutrition. Malnutrition, if you, you might think, oh, well, how does physical mental health work? Well, malnutrition is, is not just about not eating. It's about not having access to healthy options to eat. Um, a good example of something like this is if you think about some communities, they don't have a, uh, a grocery store in walking distance and they often don't have fresh fruits and vegetables. Many of them are you know, poor quality. You might have a corner store that sells them at a very high price and they're poor quality. So they don't become the thing that families um, uh, pick up naturally. And I keep this in mind, my brother is actually a researcher at Ohio State University and his, uh, his area in, inter uh, in um, internal medicine is he's a diabetologist, which I didn't know existed, but diabetes and high blood pressure are his specific areas of focus, particularly in underserved communities. And what he talks about is uh, the necessity of being able to bring together multiple systems to bring in what it is that people need for to live a healthier life. But we're teaching people something different. So we've got all of these factors impacting the overall health, well-being, and development of young people. Um, so if you just look at the other tree, what you'll notice, the, the tree on the right, it has an entire well-developed green leaf structure. And if we think Think about leaf structure, what that really is, is community, like individual social support is huge. It also includes resources, like that there are um, um, grocery stores, there are uh, access to health care is not a huge issue. And you'll see that though infant mortality exists, heart disease exists, malnutrition exists, 
that it's smaller, that the impact is not nearly as great as it is for the community or those that grow up in the zip code represented by the left tree. Um, they have health insurance, they have quality housing, the environment is clean, there's transportation services or resources to get you to and from work. The schools are a good quality school, so the, when you think about the young people, they're being educated um, and engaged in their educational system those become important. So I want you to think about it. So when we think about a tra trauma for our young people, we think about their experiences, they don't occur, of course, in isolation. I know many of you know this. Okay, trying to advance. Um, so yeah, just a notion, if you take a picture of these two, just take a look at these two images again, think about, the child on the right and then the children on the left. They're growing up very differently. You see no grass, no area for leisure recreation. Um, we talk about healthy living. You know, it's probably going to be indoors at best for the child on the right in some community gym if it exists. Uh, the children on the left probably have multiple, have significant access to multiple outlets for um, socialization. They probably have a sense of community and belonging uh, because they can get out in it. They're able to, you know, they have neighbors, they have friends they play with down the street. All of those make a difference in terms of overall health, well-being, and development. So the science is clear. The effects of trauma and adversity build up over the human lifespan and along with other social determinants of health and well-being, impact the young person's development across multiple domains. Um, we've come to understand that trauma as, is pervasive and that it's distributed inequitably, which means that, once again, um, it disproportionately impacts low-income communities, communities of color, uh, LGBTQ communities, and women and, women and girls. So, they that's that's where we see kind of the impact so uh, is of trauma is greater likely because of the social determinants of health um, as well as the socio-cultural factors many of you probably heard of an adverse childhood experiences study uh, I'm, I'm assuming uh, and basically the aces study was a study that was done in california uh, that was funded uh, in part by Kaiser Permanente. Um, Dr. Felitti was uh, uh, the, the primary researcher along with Dr. Anda. Initially, Dr. Felitti was not even looking at childhood adversity. He was trying to figure out what, were, what was the relationship between, um, actually, was, he was actually uh, running an obesity clinic uh, and trying to look at what were the ways in which you could help people, morbidly obese people, lose weight. And what he found as a result of doing that work was that many of the individuals who were morbidly obese, who also maybe didn't do as well, um, came from childhood adversity, that they had significant experiences in their childhood that impacted their overall health, their weight, their well-being. And so um, one of the next pieces was to say is, if that's true of the clients in his obesity clinic, how true is it of people generally? How, what is the impact of having um, childhood adversity on, on overall health and well-being? So there were three categories. And what they did was they just said, OK, let's, let's just do some, um, some basic surveys of individuals in a community that are, that, uh, are have Kaiser Permanente insurance and ask them during their normal visit about their childhood experiences. These were predominantly Caucasian individuals, generally would consider them middle class. Uh, most had completed a college education. And they were asking about uh, 10 different things, 10 questions that really hit on these 10 different areas. Three of them were related to abuse. So they would ask, you know, as a child before the age of 18, where you hit, kicked, um, harmed, beat up in some way uh, in your home. That's a that's physical 
emotional. Um, they were asked, did anybody, is, did anybody ever speak well of you, uh, praise you, or were you always put down, that kind of thing. Um, they also talked about sexual abuse through that before the age of 18. Did anybody ever um, touch you in uh, ways that uh, made you feel uncomfortable? So they asked about abuse. They asked about physical neglect, like not getting your basic um, needs met, emotional neglect, like nobody's really um, asked. It seems to uh, show you any level of love, affection, or the other was household dysfunction. So did anybody in your family was incarcerated? So this is not you. Did you live with a person who used substances? Um, did, was your mother a victim of domestic violence? Uh, were your parents divorced? Did anybody experience mental illness? Those are kind of household dysfunction questions they ask. And then they looked at what, does, what happens as a result of that? So then they measured in these individuals over several years and there were about 17,000 individuals. Uh, what was your level of physical activity? They measured their smoking, whether or not they engaged or uh, used alcohol to the degree would be considered alcoholism, used drugs. Were they severely obese, developed diabetes, depression, suicide attempts? So they really looked at physical and mental health outcomes related to this. And basically what they found was that um, there were significant effects as a result of childhood adversity and that these were dose dependent, which means the more types of childhood adversity you had experienced, the higher the likelihood was that you would have poorer health uh, and mental health outcomes and that you would in engage in high risk behaviors. Um, would they, ultimately found was it related to mortality. Individuals who had six or more traumatic events or, or adverse childhood adversities died 20 years younger than individuals who had no traumatic events or adverse events in their life. So that's the um, ACEs study. Uh, um, so if we take a look, ACEs study really only focused on the ho household. It did not focus on anything outside of the household. So one of the people that kind of looked at this, what happens uh, more broadly is Dr. Rich. And he was focused uh, on really the epidemic of young black men who were dying in Boston as a result of gun violence or serious assault. And he, he was a emergency, emergency room physician. And so he, he kind of studied how is this occurring and um, measuring who's coming in, who recidivates, which means do they come back through the emergency department with yet another injury, and found that it, at five years, the recurrence rate for having another injury is 44%. So 44% of the people that came in with a, with a serious injury would come back. 20% of them would die in the time frame. Um, and he documents this in a book called Wrong Place, Wrong Time, Trauma and Violence in the Lives of Young Black Men. But what I think is most important is the model that he, uh, of causality that he kind of developed in terms of how this occurs. And then therefore, how do you interrupt this? How do you, how do you decrease the recidivism level, decrease the number of young people returning? Uh, and so, he kind of mapped it and said, so a young person is shot, stabbed, or assaulted. And these were all black or brown young men between the ages of 16 and 25. Um, these young people were treated in the emergency department. They might be admitted, admitted to the inpatient surgical service. So that means that they were, you know, they they, they were operated on. Um, and then my screen is freezing. They might be discharged to the street. And so when you say discharged to the street, it, it's the same as if you or I went to the emergency room, meaning they were discharged. And when you get discharged, usually there are some sort of instructions that say things like follow up with your primary care provider within a certain amount of time, or maybe you're to follow up 
with the surgeon for a post surgical assessment, you know, within a certain period of time. And that's a pretty common thing. You know, if you come in with a, a, a severe injury, like a gunshot wound, the hospital has to take you. There's a hospital that will take you. And you go through this whole process, whether you can pay or not. Unfortunately, when you get to this stage, one of the things we see is the impact of social determinants of health, of health inequity. Um, which means that yes, any doctor, you know, would potentially see you um, and maybe you have health insurance, maybe, but the quality of services can be different based on how much insurance you can uh, afford, or even if you have it, or even if you have a primary care physician, because many of the young people did not have that. And so the impact of this becomes immediately greater. The other pieces um, you know is that there is nobody in these circles so far that is a social worker or mental health provider to talk about what just happened to this young child and what could happen after this in terms of the development of PTSD or PTSD symptoms. And so the young people got out. Uh, many of them are going back to their communities they began to experience uh, PTSD-like symptoms, particularly that intrusion and hyperarousal. And we know that hyperarousal is related to reactive aggression. So you begin to see individuals who are now maybe didn't follow up. Many of them are in pain. And so they're beginning to do things like self-medicate um, and to deal with these nightmares and all these other things that are happening. Many of them had childhood experiences before this that impact them. And so uh, what they do, they get a weapon, they self-medicate, um, they retaliate, somebody dies, somebody goes to jail, um, or someone re-enters the cycle. And so what he began to talk about was the necessity of developing navigators in the healthcare system and to connect healthcare physical health care with mental health care, as well as broader social services. So seeing what else these individuals needed um, to be successful when they came back, at when they, once they left the hospital, some needed jobs, some needed reconnection to education, some needed help uh, accessing um, health care. Uh, they provided a, a, a tr an actual group uh, called Healing Hurt People that was a part of the program where these young men and only these young men came together to talk about what happened to them and to, de to, to develop safety strategies uh, that would uh, help for their, their overall mental health and well-being. So uh, another example. So ACEs, the initial ACEs did not include, as I said, things like community violence. So Philadelphia, or actually recently there was um, a few different sites, but Philadelphia being the major site, uh, which is where the Center for Nonviolence and Social Justice is located, um, they began to look at what are some other variables that you might see besides those 10 ACEs that create adversity. So witnessing violence would be one, feeling discriminated against would be another, adverse neighborhood experiences, which the question was, you know, do you feel safe in your neighborhood? being bullied um, and living in foster care. So they added those questions and then they did a community sample uh, where they did phone questionnaires. They called people to get them and ask them, you know, kind of the 10 ACE questions in these uh, and kind of followed up and, and got them engaged and were able to do some tracking on self-report of health conditions. So just initially, when you look at this, and it's called the urban ACEs, um, we look at, at when you added witnessing violence, felt discrimination, they, they survey the entire population of the city of Philadelphia, which is urban, but has both blacks and whites. Um, they had other uh, individuals there, but the numbers were small, so they weren't included in, in many of these findings. So when you looked at it, even in this group, you'll find that witnessing violence was higher in, in people of color. You will find felt discriminations higher, adverse neighborhood experiences higher, and all of these are significant. The one that wasn't higher was bullied, meaning that it wasn't significantly different. 
uh, between populations and then living in foster care. So even people from the very same city um, who you would see a discrepancy in terms of these experiences. And it really was by zip code that you saw that difference. The other is um, when you looked at the original study and you looked at the, the uh, outcomes and you compared them to the outcomes for those who participated in Philadelphia, and this is the entire population, generally speaking, they had greater amounts of physical abuse, emotional abuse, mental illness than the original sample. Um, substance use was higher as well as was the incarceration rate. So we do know that um, while adver adverse childhood experiences and the outcomes were bad in the initial study, there are even worse outcomes uh, when we look at a more urban population. Um, if you look at four or more ACEs, and four is the uh, kind of the uh, cut point where we see much worse outcomes, you will find that in this population of people from Philadelphia, it, males who were black and lived below the poverty line were more likely to be those who experienced four or more ACEs. So often, honestly, the kids that um, live in urban communities are at greater risk, particularly the young men. So we look at ACEs and juvenile justice. Florida has done some work, has been a leader in doing some of this work in terms of just looking at ACEs. And you'll, you'll see here that um, the Florida population or the population of kids in the Florida system, um, generally speaking, had higher numbers of ACEs than the original sample. So if you look at four or more, they're the brownish colored bar, they're higher. Recidivism, oops, recidivism rates, I think is an extremely important one to look at. And we look at this, you will see this inverse relationship um, as it relates to uh, risk. So we look at a, a risk instrument uh, for these young people. The low risk individuals, low risk kids are less likely to have experienced a adverse childhood experience or less likely to experience as many adverse childhood experiences as the high risk kids. So you'll see as the number of ACEs increase, so those high risk kids, 88% or more have experienced 10 or more adverse childhood experiences. So there's a there's this relationship between this. We're not sure exactly, um, we can't call it causal, but they're definitely um, the kids that you that make it to, if you're if you're doing a good job of diverting, the kids that end up on the high end in the system are probably experienced far more ACEs and so uh, and and other kinds of uh, traumatic events. So that then leads us to this final piece, which is complex trauma. Complex trauma to me really takes into account PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, as well as some degree of um, kind of the social determinants of health and the socio-cultural trauma, so the, those pieces. And what complex trauma, which is not a, a diagnosis, you can't diagnose a person with complex trauma, but um, it's a way or a framework of understanding these things, sorry about that, is that complex trauma is chronic or multiple traumas. So more than one, one time this has happened, and there are different types of traumatic events and that these begin at an early age they're usually interpersonal in nature often um, at the hands of a caregiver or other trusted adult who's uh, supposed to care for the child and um, the most important piece is that it has a significant impact on the overall health or well-being of that young person developmentally. And so that is the um, way we think about um, complex trauma. And one of the key pieces, as I said, about complex trauma is that it includes what we call polyvictimization. Polyvictimization means that you've been victimized. So this is not a car accident, but you've been victimized in one way or another. Um, in multiple ways, more than one type of victimization. 
So it may include you've been emotionally abused, you've, you've experienced domestic violence, maybe in your home, community violence in your community, sexual or physical abuse in foster care, maybe you've been bullied at school, and maybe experienced a traumatic loss. So all of those would be victimizations. And, and the easiest way I can think about the, this impact is for this child, given all the environments in which they've been harmed, there's a sense that there's no safe place. There is no safe place, no safe person. Um, and that's extremely important for the overall health and well being of a child. Complex trauma um, can impact just about every developmental area. Um, attachment, relationship, biological, physical, cognition. And so um, when we think about these, attachment and relationships really are key. Um, I'm not gonna play this video, I have a video, but I'll attach the video um, just for time's purposes and, and, I'll, and we can attach it so that people can view it. But this is a video of a, a basically a, a session uh, where a mom and a child are coming in because uh, they're, they're studying kind of the relationship between the two of them. And this is uh, one of the centers in Philadelphia. And this young mom, her name is Pearl, has brought her child in and is participating. And they're, they're trying to determine what happens when mom leaves. What happens when she leaves the room and leaves the child there? And her child responds in a, what we call a typical way, which means that, that her child uh, will sit there a minute, begins to cry, and is really missing mom, which suggests that they have a pretty um, typical uh, attachment level. But one of the things Pearl talks about is that that was not always true. Um, she herself had experienced uh, neglect, emotional and physical abuse as a child. And as a result of that, really had trouble hearing her own daughter when she cried because it became like a trauma reminder. It took her back to that place uh, of her as a young child not getting her needs met uh, and she would walk away. So the clinic actually works to develop to that level of attachment between parent and child. So they're, they're doing some measuring of that. But what it says is we know that kids who experience uh, um, disruptions in attachment have far worse uh, health and mental health outcomes. We also know that social development can be impacted by complex trauma. So one of the pieces besides the relationship with your family that's important is for adolescents, we know that socially, um, social development is key for them, that they, they, they prefer often uh, networking with peers. And, and I think that that is one of the pieces that we forget about it when we put kids into residential settings. We just, in many ways, don't really consider that we might be harming them because they're, they're disconnected from their peers. And even when we look to the programs themselves, there is far more separation um, of young people than attempts to help them learn to engage uh, in healthy relationships, well, even while they're there social relationships, teaching them social skills, um, just in the milieu. So what we see is individuals who experience the complex trauma often have trouble in relationships. This young person's very clear, don't trust anybody. Uh, that you don't have to guess. Sometimes I wish kids came with like, oh, you know, a little manual, but we know this because you work with these young people. They often expect to be maltreated or abandoned. Um, they're suspicious of other people. Sometimes they will isolate and withdraw in order to protect themselves. Um, they're not very good sometimes at seeing from another's perspective and that's really a self-preservation. Learning kind of empathy, learning to compromise, seeing from another's perspective is something that has to be taught through experience. And, and that may not have occurred. Uh, sometimes they have trouble with social boundaries. You'll see these kids at times uh, being very intrusive into your space, into other spaces. Um, and then you, you might find that they engage in relationships that are marked by violence. Uh, even intimate partner relationships, you may see that 
a good portion of the time, there's a good level of violence that occurs. Some kids have learned, as, as uh, one of uh, the young people that I work with talked about, is that I, I see that if somebody loves you and you do something to hurt them, um, that they should hurt you physically. That lets you know that they love you. And that is a very different way of thinking about um, what love means. The other part we think about uh, in terms of development that can be impacted is the biological or physical development. Um, and young people are really challenged in, uh, as teens just by their own hormones and biology. So they are often, you know, they grow at different rates. Uh, they look very different at different times. They've got, you know, pimples and all kinds of things that impact their overall feeling about self. Um, in addition, we know that the teenage years are the time where individuals are more focused or you begin to have these secondary sex characteristics occur. So they, they, their breasts change, their, you know, their voices change. In addition to that, um, be, they begin to develop more and more of these uh, uh, desire for um, sexual intimacy. So if these are what normal kids want, this is a part of normal development. The kids in our programs also experience this. And often our programs are uh, divided along lines of gender and, and some of our programs are very long. And so you've got kids that don't have the opportunity to interact with uh, people that would be you know, appropriate partners for them based upon their sexual orientation. Um, and so that is, is kind of an additional part that can impact development um, if they are placed in a setting. Other things we know is that trauma itself can have a significant impact on health. The ACEs study told us that, but they were really looking at adults and, and having them remember all, all the way back to childhood about their experiences. These studies really looked at, looked at children and adolescents and then looking forward towards health outcomes. And what they found that um, childhood and adolescent adversity was associated with asthma, obesity, infection, um, impact on the immune system, and part of that is stress also can degrade your ability to fight infection. It, 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 it affects your immunity. That's why when you work really hard to take a vacation and you're not sleeping, you're just driving, by the time you get on the vacation, you finally get sick. That's your immune system has been broken down by the stresses of preparing to go. Um, somatic complaints, you know, you, you often have our kids talk about headaches, stomach aches, those kinds of things. Um, and then there's a second study there at the bottom that talks about that early childhood adversity not only affects health, but also substance use. And it's not that people with early childhood uh, experiences use substances and then become unhealthy. Both things can happen parallel and in combination. So you don't have to have substance use to have poor health outcomes. So what that, does that mean for our kids? Detained youth, the kids that we serve, tend to have higher morbidity, higher mortality um, compared to the general adolescent population. Our kids are sicker. And adolescents, uh, teenagers, the pediatric population is not supposed to be as sick as the adult population, but it just brings attention to the fact that healthcare is extremely important in, in programs and facilities. Um, related to substance abuse, you begin to see, and, and self, sex risk, health risk behaviors, our kids engage in a lot of risky health behaviors. Um, and they tend to have a lot of health problems uh, that they wanna be seen for. In girls, we know that uh, childhood adversity or trauma can create early onset puberty. You might see uh, precocious and more risky behaviors. Uh, they tend to suffer from obesity, which is one of the reasons why when we look at what we serve kids every day, uh, if you have a program that serves boys and girls, the girls uh, are not supposed to eat the same thing as the boys. Uh, they sh their, their level of calorie intake should be different. Now, they're going to complain if they know what the boys get, but that's the reality of it. 
and that they have a greater um, risk of suicide and self-injury. Cognition, uh, I like to talk about the invisible suitcase. And the reason is that when we think about the invisible suitcase, it, it really is how trauma changes the way our young people think about themselves, the world around them, and the adults that, they, that care for them. Uh, so you may see that because of everything that has happened, my thinking tends to be um, more paranoid or um, not as trusting. So you might say, no one loves me, get them before they get you, it's all my fault, you're gonna hurt me, grownups lie, I'm bad, I'm no sucker, or you're paid to care. These thought process, processes do not just magically appear. They come out of the child's experiences. And so keeping that in mind when you're working with a young person is, is important because you are battling these thought processes to help a child to be able to um, reach their full potential. So if they don't trust you, if they believe you're just paid to care, you probably are not going to have a major impact. So building that relationship with them, trying to come up with a, a way to um, engage that feels trustworthy is extremely important. So we think about adolescents uh, in, in terms of other forms of cognition. Um, it's about their decision making and their behavior. And we know that the brain develops at different rates. So the part of the brain that we call the socio-emotional section or the limbic system, that's the do what feels good section of our brain. And that develops far earlier for young people, for everybody, um, than the break system, which is the frontal lobe that says, I'd love to, but I can't. Um, and so what we find is typical adolescents are very, um, uh, into themselves, what works for me, do what feels good, that's normal. So when you have these young people in, in facilities, you have to consider that that's what they're going to want. You know, I want me, 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 me. That is, that is an adolescent. Um, and so, but they're developing kind of the ability to um, think a little bit more before they act on their emotion or wants. The other thing that it teaches us though, is that when we look at those parts of the brain, young people are far more motivated by incentives than punishment. And unfortunately, many times our systems are built on punitive um, as, a, as a, you know, they won't come back because it was so bad, as opposed to looking at how do we help these kids progress developmentally and incentivize those um, behaviors uh, for them. And so that, that's very important. So punitive punishment. The other piece is kids who have high trauma experiences, they um, are a little bit recalcitrant to um, all of the negativity or punitive because they're used to punitive. So how do you kind of switch your system up for that? We know that kids have trouble with self-concept often. They have trouble uh, in terms of their future orientation. For the most part, when you think about you know, future orientation, most people um, help their kids to focus on what next. Uh, lots of times, if you think about those social determinants of health and well being and the communities and resources, many of these kids just don't have them. They don't have as many of the adult mentors, they don't have as many places. Um, to, to, to go where they might have more adult mentors, whether they be boys and girls clubs or uh, their school may have additional activities that don't cost money to participate in, they have less access. And their thinking is pretty negative. So they don't really think about the future. That makes it more challenging to motivate them to engage in behaviors that um, can propel them into the future. So what do you do? And I'm gonna just go over a few basic things here. Um, the three things I would say you wanna focus on are building resilience. Uh, you wanna look at trauma responsive and caring communities. So how do you develop those in your program and building relationships? And they are interconnected. 
those three things sh are should be happening together. So um, I'm also not going to. There's another video that talks about this construct of resilience, which I will. It's two minutes. I'll let. I'll put it. We'll put it up as a link. And I'll talk briefly about um, resilience. But resilience really is one's ability to adapt to hardship, uh, ability to um, respond or develop skills to overcome hardship. And so these are the ones that Ann Matson talks about as the primary um, variables that we know relates to better outcomes for young people. Having a supportive family, which you might say, well, some of our kids don't have that. Teaching them how to build a family. Where do you? Where is it that you um, develop a family of choice? For me, when we move, it's my church. Uh, my church family is really important to me. I move a lot, and it's the place where I go to get my children, additional aunts, uncles, grandparents, to go to events because my family lives too far away. Peer support is important. So finding ways in which to help kids engage with peers while they're in programs and then teaching them where to gain um, opportunities for additional peer support in the community that is socially uh, acceptable and promotes their overall health and well-being competence is being good at something and so teaching kids skills things that they can do feel proud about and be praised for self-efficacy is problem solving so teaching kids how to get through um, difficult time situations or solve problems. Self-esteem, of course, is important. We want to be able to um, uh, appropriately help kids develop that. Being connected to your school, so the degree possible, we know that school is, is probably the second most important thing outside of family because it's where they receive social support and also additional adults. Um, that may be a part of their lives. And then we know that kids who have a strong spiritual belief tend to do better. So trauma responsive practice is the second, and we've talked about trauma a lot today. One of the, these are some essential pieces I want you to understand. Trauma disrupts one's sense of safety um, and trust. Trauma disrupts your sense of power or control. Um, it, it disrupts your ability to trust others. It disproportionately impacts people of color. Uh, and those who um, are poor, or what I call other, um, and can decrease one's sense of community and social support. So given that, when you look at developing a trauma responsive culture, I like to say these are the building blocks that have to be a focus for you. Safety, empowerment, voice and choice, trust, trauma competence, developing a culturally linguistically responsive um, environment and uh, ensuring that you have policies and procedures in place as well as training um, to help individuals who work there to develop that. NCTSN has a curriculum that I developed for them called Think Trauma Training for Staff in Juvenile Justice and Residential Settings. It is a training for staff um, who work in programs or in contact with kids in the justice system. A second um, resource here is the essential elements of a trauma-informed juvenile justice system. It outlines um, eight, and it, it's list, it is a connected resource for you on this webinar that you can download. Um, eight uh, essential components to developing a trauma responsive um, um, residential program, but it could also be for community based programs. We know that relationships are key. We know that building relationships, because influencing individuals to be able to um, have a better outcome really only happens in the context of relationships. Development only happens in the context of a relationship. Babies, children, you cannot effectively develop without um, adults who are there to help you. One of the things I did in Los Angeles County is they were looking at how do we build a model that is more therapeutic and kind of utilizes all the best practices we know that are developmentally appropriate and trauma responsive. Um, we built something, we, we utilized uh, what they wanted, which was a, a number of these constructs and said, how do you build an actual program based upon those? So I worked with uh, Ken Ellis, who's from Missouri Youth Services um, and myself to develop a curriculum 
that is embodies some of this for them. It's not complete. Um, they uh, were not able to continue for some parts of it, but um, basically it's a curriculum and it's also uh, compatible with their environment. So this is the environment uh, of the LA County um, facility. It's called Campus Kilpatrick. Uh, the one on the left top is the beds in the old facility. And just what I wanna point out there is if you look at that, that um, really is the opposite. It does not communicate safety. Many of the kids in the back did not feel safe. And you can imagine that two staff trying to supervise that number of kids, it also did not um, help to cultivate relationships. The new environment is designed to be developmentally appropriate and to cultivate relationships. Um, then we really went through and said, how do you make sure that people have more staffing um, in order to be able to cultivate relationships and that their, their job descriptions fit that? Um, we started working with uh, the core values, which are trauma responsive, safety, respect, collaboration, commitment. And we work with the team, including the young people, to come up with these. And those four core values guide everything, all the decisions we make. Um, we noticed that there were a lot of siloing for the programs that serve these kids. And so what we did was say, you guys are going to need to coordinate. And that's when we came to de developing the actual stage system. The developmental stage system, which is a part of their case management process, is built on the positive youth justice model. And um, it involves that core support team. And it marries all of the services kids are receiving, mental health, uh, education, even food service, um, all the community-based um, programs into one system that worked together to guide the person, a kid through the program. It was based on the two core assets, which I know you guys talked about in your last training. So it's the learning, doing, and attaching belonging, and focused on the six domains, work, education, relationships, community, health, and creativity. And the stages were all built upon skills you wanted kids to develop in that area across their stay. And then those were continued into community. What it allowed us to do is to say, these are the resources a program has. These are all the people who are trying to provide services. How do we coordinate them under one model that allowed us to get kids what they needed and to be able to um, teach them, actually teach skills and have staff have things they needed to work with kids on to help them in these areas so that at the end, the kids had what they needed to be successful upon reentry, which included, of course, we had communities coming in. So that's really a big piece of uh, what I recommend. This is a, the trace instrument is an instrument I use with uh, Florida Department of Juvenile Justice to help them to evaluate their success in um, this area, uh, becoming a more trauma responsive and caring environment. And so with that, there's some additional pictures, but these are just really uh, pictures of how, you know, how do you do safety? How do you um, develop developing appropriate places? Um, and so, uh, but those are pretty self-explanatory. So sorry, sorry for the time, I didn't leave a lot, but if we have questions. Monique, we didn't have any questions come in. Okay. okay. So Monique, I'll, I'll take Monique. over from here. Um, yeah. Again, this is Wendy. Um, thank you so much uh, for your presentation today. It was very engaging and, and thought provoking. Um, I do wanna provide a, a few reminders to the participants. Uh, please mark your calendars. Our next webinar is scheduled to be held Thursday, October 10th at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That will be on using data to make informed decisions. In addition, um, your implementation plans, I know they're gonna be your first draft, but those are due to me by tomorrow, close of business. And then for all of you, your cohort calls start next month. If you haven't received your call-in information, please send me an email to let me know, and we'll make sure we get that right out to you. Lastly, as Darlene pointed out at the beginning, uh, there will be a short survey for you to take upon closing out of the application. So if you could please complete that, um, we will use your feedback to improve on future webinars.
So with that, I thank everyone for their participation today and have a great afternoon. Goodbye.